in the interest of time, I, I, I'll, I'll get going. I imagine more people will be joining in the next uh, few minutes. But yeah, so first of all, yeah, good afternoon. And uh, thank you so much uh, for all of you for, for taking time out to, to be with us. Uh, and, and on behalf of uh, Jen and Brian and Donica and Elizabeth um, and myself, welcome uh, to the launch of this uh, new series called Tackling uh, Global Challenges. Uh, this is episode one of uh, season one of uh, what we hope will be a, a, a hit series. So I'm, I'm going to take just a just a couple minutes to uh, tell you about what we're what we're hoping to accomplish before I, I turn it over to Mike. Um, I, I think our, our goal is pretty simple. We're we're trying to shine a spotlight on a particular problem area in sustainability. Uh, in order to help inspire some creative thinking and critical analysis uh, to come up with new solutions. So um, we, we're going to have a, a topic for each uh, season um, and, and topic, the topic for season one is plastic. So uh, sustainability challenges uh, associated with the manufacture and uh, particularly end of use of plastic products and uh, the, the crisis of plastic pollution. Um, so we, what we hope you're gonna be able to uh, take away from this series is uh, first of all, a, a better understanding of the challenges. Uh, so so the, the magnitude, the complexities, uh, the nature of the challenges, is it technological, behavioral, policy, uh, et cetera. Um, but we're, we're not going to wallow in despair. There's plenty to despair about with respect to plastic. Um, so I, th I think more importantly than talking about the problems, um, we hope that at least some of you will come away from, from these sessions uh, seeing new opportunities uh, to develop solutions. Um, and at, at the Tomcat Center, we are uh, particularly interested in helping to support solutions uh, in the form of, of innovations that lead to new companies uh, and new products. Um, and uh, it, it certainly, I think that the dream, if, if new ideas come about uh, through this series um, that then turn into teams that then try to translate them, um, then we would certainly uh, love to help out in any way that we can uh, through the center. Uh, we like plastic uh, for this first season because uh, it's a, the, the challenges are multifaceted. Um, there are, there are many different ways of approaching it. You can approach it scientifically. You can approach it from an engineering perspective, from a, a logistics perspective, from consumer um, preferences, behavior, uh, policy, uh, et cetera. So there's, there's a, a really a, a lot to, uh, to think about uh, in terms of, of solutions in this space. Um, just a word about the logistics. So um, Mike will give a presentation. Uh, if you have uh, questions that come up during the presentation, um, you can chat them. Uh, you'll see, the, please, please chat them to me. Um, you only have a couple of, of choices um, for the hosts. Uh, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll have uh, a discussion session. I'll try to pull as many questions as I can uh, to have a discussion uh, with Mike and then uh, at about five o'clock, um, I understand that you know many people have uh, uh, other <laughs> other time constraints. So uh, so those of you who can stay a little bit afterwards, um, we'll have an opportunity to extend the discussion, depending on the number of participants. Um, maybe make it a, a little bit more free flowing uh, in the last uh, half hour or so. Um, so with that, let, let me just give a, a, a real quick introduction to uh, our speaker, Mike Biddle. Um, Mike is uh, really eminently qualified to discuss this topic from just about every perspective. Uh, so his, his educational background was in chemical engineering and uh, polymer science. Uh, he worked in industry for, for some of the giants, including uh, Dow Chemical. Um, and then he uh, it, it partly, I think, in conjunction with this, a, a stint here at Stanford as a Sloan Fellow at the GSB, he uh, he launched his own uh, company, uh, MBA Polymers, uh, I think a, a little over 20 years ago now. 
uh, to try to develop technology to, to take, uh, you know, fr frankly, garbage and uh, extract the plastics, separate them, process them, get them back uh, into the hands of, of uh, customers that can turn those into, into plastic products. They have uh, successfully commercialized this technology and uh, scaled this technology. Uh, those of you who, who had a chance to look at the briefing materials can see some of the some of the content uh, around that. So uh, Mike has certainly engaged this from an entrepreneur's perspective, and, and now he's the managing director of uh, Evoke Innovations, uh, which invests in uh, new ventures uh, working on uh, industrial innovations. So uh, Mike, uh, again, we're, we're very grateful for you to be, uh, to be the, the pioneer here for this uh, event, and uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for the kind uh, introduction. Um, and uh, let's see, I've got to share my screen here. So give me a second. I hope that works. That seemed to work for folks. We still see the side paint. Now it's in the presentation view. Perfect. Thank Phew, you. Good. I love it when technology works. <laughs> Um, yeah, I titled this Connecting the Dots because uh, the, the Tomcat team gave me a, a bit of a daunting challenge. There, there was a lot of things they wanted me to cover, which I thank them for, but <laughs> you know, in a limited amount of time and on such a complicated subject, uh, there's only so much I can cover. So what I am going to try to do is connect some of the dots and specifically uh, around the intersection of plastics, of course, the, the main topic energy and human well-being, because I think there, there's a lot of overlap there and there's a lot of tie-ins and I hope to connect some of those dots for you. Um, I can't go into a lot of depth uh, in such a short presentation and because there are so many dots to connect. Um, and that's, I hope you had a chance to look at the briefing materials. If you didn't, I would encourage you to take a look at them after uh, this presentation because it will fill in a lot of the, the gaps uh, that I'm not gonna be able to cover in, in a short presentation today. Um, and I realize, I believe I'm speaking to a lot of uh, students and uh, teachers, so I've tried to gear it a bit in that direction. So uh, there's a lot of new material here I've never tried out before. And Janika will tell you, I just sent her a few minutes ago <laughs> another ver version. So it's, it's, it's a fresh work. Uh, so this will be a journey we'll take together. <laughs> this will be my first time giving this particular presentation as well. So there are a lot of dots. Uh, when you look at these these three big areas and the opportunities and challenges in these areas. In fact, this would be a tiny part of the universe of opportunities and challenges that I see in the areas of plastics, energy, and, and human well-being. So I'm hoping by I'm hoping I'm going to identify a few signposts, at least how I identify signposts in my own journey in playing in these three areas. And and hopefully some of those signposts maybe won't be your signposts and you'll be connecting different dots but maybe there's some learnings uh, from the many mistakes I'll say I made in, in the 30 year, my 30 year journey um, that I hope can be applied to your own journey that you decide to take. Um, and hopefully by the end, when your first journey, let's say you end up in a, in a beautiful connection of the dots that fits something valuable and beautiful, but it won't be, I guarantee you when you get to your, the end of your first journey, it's not the end. It just keeps getting more, there's more dots to connect, more challenges to, to, to tackle, and ever more opportunities. So uh, that's one of the messages I want to send to you. It's a, it's, a, it's a lifelong journey. I've got lots of dots in front of me. I'm going to continue to keep connecting for many decades, I hope. So I'll start off with a bit of my background. Uh, Matt was kind enough to give it, so I'll, I'll just do this very briefly because we are a product. I mean, many of the perspectives I'm going to be, shared, be sharing with you were developed through my own experience, my own career. So I, let, let's see how those might have developed and why. And I will say I started off just trying to make a living and ended up now trying to make an impact. It's pretty simple. I don't think that's much different from anyone else. Uh, I left college with uh, debt and had to find my own way. So I had a lot of bills to pay and I had to figure out how to make a living first. So I started off working at some great companies. I learned a lot in my first decade of work. Uh, these were extremely well-managed companies, uh, particularly at the time frame when I was working in them, uh, say three decades or so ago. 
And once I felt I kind of learned what I wanted to learn and I saw some challenges I wanted to try to tackle, I sent, I uh, created a consulting company called Michael, Mike Biddle and Associates or MBNA for short. And uh, to be honest, that was just going to be a holding pattern. That was going to allow me to figure out what I wanted to do next with my life. But it eventually turned into this thing called MBA Polymers that I'm going to talk a bit about uh, today in the presentation. Uh, and eventually uh, a uh, international, uh, multinational uh, plastics recycling company. Uh, I then pretty much did the same thing again. After I felt like I had learned what I could learn and shown, proven what I wanted to prove with MBA Polymers, uh, eight or so years ago, I decided to form a, a separate company called Material Solutions, which was again a consulting company trying to figure out how to uh, pass along the torch, uh, basic on circular economy. So I, I actually worked with a lot of Fortune 100 companies all the way down to small enterprises and even startups on trying to figure out how do you embed circular economy principles both in big organizations and how do you build companies based on circular economy principles. And more recently, I joined Evoke Innovations a little over five years ago, where we invest in clean energy, clean tech, climate tech, and carbon tech opportunities, all the new tech acronyms. Um, and by the way, I became a dad along this journey too. This is an important aspect. And uh, so full, full disclosure here, uh, there'll probably be some fatherly advice DNA spread scattered throughout some of these slides, particularly since I am, I believe I'm talking to some students in the audience today. I've got a, uh, an incredible uh, daughter who's a sophomore in college studying engineering, wanting to change the world. And I have an incredible son who's a sophomore in high school trying to do the same thing, teaching me daily, uh, reteaching me chemistry and math uh, almost every day, it seems like. And one of the, the common themes through all of this is on a sustainability theme. And the sustainability, I know it's, 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 um, it's a bit overused these days, perhaps, but I think it's still important. And it, you can see it's embedded in MBA polymers from the early days. It's something we thought was really important and a guiding principle. And we've always thought about it, not just from the environmental sense, which is how it's usually taken, but in a much more holistic uh, way of looking at what sustainability means. Uh, and one way of looking at this is the three pillars, the three Ps, people, prosperity, and planet, or if you will, social, economic, and environmental uh, factors. And I like to throw in a fourth P, particularly on my, my most recent journey, and that's passion, because I, we need passion. If we're gonna solve these problems, we need people with passion trying to tap into these, or solve these problems and tap into the opportunities represented by trying to come up with a more sustainable future. Now, I have to admit, if some old geezer like me were telling me in my, when I was in college that I needed passion in order to be successful in life, I would have chuckled. And I probably, the image that would have come up in my mind would have been something like this, which is if you go to Wikipedia, this is the image for passion that comes up. But what I have in mind is not that type of passion, it's this type of passion represented by people like Greta. And I'm not the only one that thinks passion is important. Uh, Elon Musk, for example, says uh, passion and purpose scale. Always have and always will. Steve Jobs said you need a lot of passion because what you're doing is probably so hard. If you don't have that passion, any rational person would give up. And that's something I can really relate to. I can tell you I've been called irrational more than once in my life. And finally, I'll just one more quote. I don't want to over quote you, but uh, I, I love this one from Oprah, who says, follow your passion because it will lead you to your purpose. And that's indeed how I'm gonna start off the talk. Uh, so the navigation for today's presentation is I'm gonna to try to answer four questions. Uh, the first is, why are we here? What's our purpose? The second is, where do we wanna go? Kind of what's the vision for the future we'd like to see? How do we get there? What's our strategy? And who's gonna get us there? Who's gonna take responsibility? Now. It ended up, when I finally put this together, I'll probably get to four more than I get to, before I get to three, and I think you'll understand uh, by the, uh, the time we get to that point, uh, why I jumped to four before I actually answer three. So I'll start with why I'm here. I assume you know why you're here, so I'll explain why I think I'm here. And maybe one question on your mind I get a lot is why in the world did I spend three decades of my life playing with plastics? Well, 
it has something to do with this equation. And if you don't know what this equation is, that's okay. I'm going to come back to it. I, in all honesty, I had to look it up on Google to make sure I had the equation format, right? Um, and if, I, if you look at when I entered the plastics world, when I got out of college in the late 70s, um, plastics were the grooviest material on the planet. You could make anything out of plastics, any shape, any form, any color. And I may or may not have had a polyester suit similar to the one on the right. Uh, but I definitely had hair, unfortunately, very similar to that in that time frame. In fact, I wish I had some of it now, but it's uh, gone, I think. But even more importantly for me, or more interestingly for me, it was the material of the future. At least it felt that way in the 70s and 80s and 90s even. And in fact, life said, hey, we can have a, a great future with this, this new wonderful material because we can have a throwaway lifestyle, much easier living. And we're going to come back to how that's uh, maybe not turned out the way we had hoped it would. And of course, I have to I have to refer to this movie. This this will date you if you if you remember this movie. I'm hoping that even though this was probably uh, this was released well before many people in the in the audience were born. Uh, this is uh, the Graduate with Dustin Hoffman, and it's one of the most famous one line um, uh, one liners <clears throat> in movie history. So Dustin just graduated from college. He's getting a one word advice from a family friend <clears throat> at his graduation uh, celebration. And that one word of advice, I usually ask the audience when it's live, what's that one word? And it's amazing. Almost everyone in the audience knows, of course, it's plastics. <clears throat> what's scary is whoever put that in the movie was amazingly uh, prescient because plastics have been have had insane growth since the early 50s and 60s. And in fact, it's projected to continue in this fashion. And this is a good introduction to, to bring back that, that equation. So remember that simple equation? Well, it's an exponential function, which means rapid growth up and to the right. And I think the plastics, the growth of the plastics industry, if nothing else, has definitely experienced exponential growth since the 60s in particular. So as I was getting out of college, I had popular movies and math pointing me to plastics as the future. My chemical engineering degree was the perfect entry ticket. So off I went and jumped into the plastics industry. Something else happened in the late 70s. I don't know if anyone on, is old enough to remember, like me, the sitting in gas lines. There was this thing called the gas crisis. This is actually a picture in, in uh, California. I remember sitting with my car, my gas guzzling car in gas lines waiting to get to fill it up in the 70s. <clears throat> and in the 80s, this was followed by the garbage crisis. So if you think about this from a plastics perspective, I was in an industry where the raw material for the industry, we were worried that we weren't going to have enough of it in the future and its price was going to be unstable and expensive. And on the other end, we didn't know what to do with all this material we were making and, and putting out into the world. Well, on the, on the what do you do with it after you make it Front, at least here in the US, we figured we'll just send it to other countries, mostly China and Southeast Asia. And they would handpick through the plastics we send them and they would recycle what they could, but most of the stuff we sent them were the, the, most, the very difficult to recycle plastics. So of course, they just discarded them and often that discarding them meant down a ravine or in a river. And I, can, I have hundreds of these pictures uh, that I've seen with my own eyes of what this has done to waterways around the world. Um, people will try to recycle this material, but the majority of it, a human being simply can't differentiate and recycle. The fellow in the lower left in the, the canoe is pulling straws out of the, the river because straws are mostly made out of one material and he can try to recycle that. Of course, if it's in the rivers, it's gonna end up in the oceans. One of the links in the pre-read uh, pre materials that I, I put in was from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on a study they did that estimates that there may be more plastic than fish in the oceans by 2050. And of course, when marine life encounters that plastic in the oceans, it's usually not a good outcome. If they ingest it, it's not a good outcome. If they get entangled in it, it's not a good outcome. And National Geographic brought this to our attention. In fact, uh, I think they're, they're, very, they're, they're suggesting that perhaps plastics will re replace our melting icebergs 
uh, because there's so much plastic on the planet with this, this cover that they did a few years ago. In fact, I met the author of this, this uh, pretty substantial article. I don't, you probably can't see the, the quote in the lower left. It's from Sylvia Earle. Uh, she says, plastics aren't inherently bad. It's what we do or don't do with them that counts. Now, I want you to remember that because I'm going to come back to that point a little later. And they, of course, pointed to this, this exponential growth of the plastics as being the source, the fundamental source, source of the problem. And they quote, you know, studies that have shown that as much as 18 billion pounds of plastic enter the oceans each and every year around the world. 18 billion pounds. I, I, I think that's a hard number for any of us to put in perspective. So I'm going to lean on an artist to help help put this in a little bit more in perspective. This was a uh, art exhibit at the Zurich Museum of Design. This, this is amount of plastic that enters the oceans over a certain period of time. And I want you just for the next three or four seconds to think what the time period is. Is it a year? Is it months? Is it weeks? Is it days? So think about what you guess, be honest with yourself. This is how much plastic, you can see people on the left to put in perspective, this goes back a long way. This is a pretty big pile of plastic. It's how much plastic enters the oceans every 15 seconds. So of course, if it's entering the oceans, it's probably entering the fish. The fish do nibble on the stuff. And in fact, uh, this there's in fact most fish have found if you um, studies have found that most of the fish in the oceans have plastic in them, and this, these percentages go up each and every year. The amount, the percentage of plastics they're they're finding in fish, or the percent of fish they're finding with plastics in their digestive tracts. So where else do you might say, well, I don't eat fish. I'm sorry for the fish, and I'm sorry for the marine life, but I don't have to worry about it because I don't eat that much fish. And of course, if I do, it's probably not, I'm not going to eat the plastic in the fish. I'll sort it out. Well, it's in your sea salt. It might, might not surprise you because plastics are in the ocean. But it's also in your bottled water. It's in your tap water. It's even in your beer. It's on every corner of the globe. It's in Rocky Mountain snow and rain. They found it in snow melt up to 150,000 particles per liter in the Bavarian Alps. And even in the Arctic, they found up to 14,000 particles per liter in snow melt from the Arctic. So it is truly ubiquitous. A study from the American Chemical uh, Society last year, or published in the American Chemical Society Proceedings uh, last year, estimated that Americans may consume between 39,000 and 52,000 particles of plastics each year. And they said if you include inhalation, it may be over 100,000 particles a year. Now, a lot of this is not from plastic articles. It's from clothing. It's from microplastics that, where we shed it in our washing machines. But it's still a lot of plastic that we're ingesting. So you might ask, isn't, ingest isn't this a problem if we're ingesting so much plastic? Well, I guess the good news is at least we know how to get rid of it. Maybe some of the, the, the pieces that are meant at much of the marine life is ingesting, as you saw from the photographs, is too large for them to discard but the plastics that are entering humans are typically microplastics that work their way through us, we think, for the most part. And in fact, when they did a, a study of random individuals in Vienna recently, they sampled people from eight different countries and found 100% of the folks had plastic in their discharge. <laughs> so it, the good news is, it, the bad news is coming in. The good news is, let's hope all of it's going out. But there, it's not necessarily all good news if it's, if it's uh, coming out. The plastics are acting like little sponges. Um, the good news about them acting as little sponges is they act like little magnets in the ocean for certain types of toxins we've dumped in the oceans for years, particularly oil-based toxins like PCBs and DTTs, because they're hydrophobic. They don't like to be in the water. You know, Oil and water don't mix. A lot of the plastics are hydrophobic, so the, 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 what they're finding is a lot of these toxins are preferentially attaching to the plastics and concentrating into the plastic particles, which would be great if we could then pull these sponges back out of the ocean because we would have cleaned up the oceans. However, the plastics uh, usually enter the ecosystem before we fish it out of, the out of the oceans, and in fact, we're not really fishing any of the plastics out of the oceans today. 
So some of that plastic that's loaded with those toxins is being ingested by the fish. Of course, it gets reabsorbed back into the fish and then we eat the fish. So you might think of the plastics as being a keystone contaminant. They're allowing the completion of the circular economy from all the toxins we put into the ocean can enter back to, the, to their source, namely humans. So what can you do? Well, you could help increase awareness. <clears throat> uh, I love, love the picture in the upper right. That's from Ben Von, Von Wong. He's an artist in San Francisco. I got to hang out with him last year uh, on a boat when we were going through the North Atlantic Gyre and seeing all the plastic in, in that particular uh, garbage patch, if you will, of the ocean. And he tries to bring people, uh, tries to bring attention to the, how much plastic we consume and discard of each year through his artwork. Other people, you see other forms of artwork here, some more pointed than others. The one that I would suggest that you might spend some time looking at is uh, a film called, uh, by Chris Jordan called Midway. Chris is a, an artist that, that uses art, both uh, film and uh, photographs to shine a light on a lot of the challenges uh, that we face in modern society. And he, one of the things he's done called the film called Midway is he went to Midway Island, which is breeding ground for the largest albatross in the world. Tens of thousands of these albatross breed on Midway Island and Midway Island's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It, it doesn't really have a population other than a few scientists on it. So there's no plastic waste being generated on the island. However, it's like a net in the middle of the ocean. So a lot of plastic waste that's in the ocean finds its way to Midway Island and the birds eat it. Either because there's food that, that is grown on the plastic or they mistaken, mistaken it for food. You can see cigarette lighters, bottle caps. It's amazing what they find in, in the residue from these uh, albatross carcasses. And he's made a film about it. It's only, you can watch the trailer. It's only about three and a half minutes. I strongly encourage you to do that. And I challenge you to try to leave with a, without shedding a tear after watching this film. I know every single time I watch it, I, I can't uh, walk away without uh, tearing up. It's uh, very well done. So art's one way, we can draw people's attention to it, but maybe we should be more direct and just ban these horrible materials, right? I mean, after all, they, you could consider them the ocean's deadliest predator. And as my kids like to say, Dad, it's complicated. Um, you'd certainly be in good company, <laughs> or you'd be in lots of company, I'll say, if you wanted to ban plastic. Uh, there's, there's dozens and dozens of NGOs, I know, a lot of the people that run these NGOs who would like to ban plastics, you can get a self-help book that will tell you how to end your relationship with plastic or to go plastic free or how to shed plastic from your life. Or you can ask the government to ban plastics. So India passed not too long ago, one of the world's toughest anti-plastics laws. And you can see why I've been to India. I've seen streams like this. I've been to Southeast Asia, China. It, it, is, it is heartbreaking. Uh, to see these, these streams, these rivers, just where you have really struggled to see the water in them. So you can see why they would go to this extreme. But I'd like to ask, do you think banning plastics would lead us to a better future? It turns out plastics are often the most efficient and best environmental material choice, that, which is why they're used. So let's just look at a few examples. <clears throat> and automobiles or durable goods. Uh, this was a study uh, done in Europe. Um, if you replaced plastics with the next most logical material, which would be a metal in most cases, you dramatically uh, require much more land use. Your mineral depletion would be significantly higher as would your energy use, your water use, and your CO2 emissions. None of these things, that's not the direction we wanna head in making material choices for the products we, we enjoy. You said, fine, okay, that's durable goods. What about packaging? What about single use materials? Well, this study looked at consumer goods, which included packaging and included food packaging as well, which is often considered uh, single use one-way plastics. And they tried to, it's a group called True Cost. I know the CEO of True Cost, they do pretty good work. Um, it's imperfect, but at least they took a shot at trying to put, put costs on things that are hard to, to figure out costs of, such as ocean damage. 
So they said using plastics and in, in a business as usual approach, there's probably about $139 billion worth of environmental costs associated to plastic every year um, in the consumer goods sector. If you switch to more sustainable plastics, like Matt and his group at Stanford are trying to do, come up with, with better plastics that have a more sustainable, lower, lower footprint, lower environmental footprint, you can lower that cost pretty substantially, but it's not gonna to go to zero. And if you use alternative to plastics, you can probably figure out where this is going given the scale on the left. They concluded that the best alternatives to plastics would, would have a much more significant environmental footprint. And if you tease this out a bit and, and ask in what way, if you look at just climate change, um, health of humans and ecosystem and damage to the oceans, again, ecosystem, uh, excuse me, True Cost tried to do that. And these were the, the differences they came up with. Now, again, this is an imperfect study, but it's the only one I know of where they've actually tried to rank uh, materials alternatives to plastic on, on these types of dimensions. A very difficult thing to do, but at least someone's, someone's trying to do it. So now I was faced with a problem. What do, what do I do? I, I, this material's it's got a bad rep. It was the space age sexiest material on the planet when I entered the industry and it, now it's got this tarnished image and it's, it's complicated, right? Uh, so what do I wanna do? I, I don't think I wanna not use plastics but I also don't want them to end up in the waste stream. So I said, why can't we turn lemons into lemonade? Why can't we change the traditional way of making plastics? If we start with waste instead of petrochemicals, we've got a plentiful and growing supply and we've got lower costs that's not tied to oil. Our plants turn out to be a lot lower capital cost to build. They consume 80 to 90% lower energy. And I'll come back to that. Um, I'll sh sh share some data with you on that point. And these plants will make any type of plastic you feed them. A petrochemical plant will make one type of plastic for its entire life. So if the market changes for that plastic or the dynamics change, you're stuck with a huge capital investment making one type of plastic. Whereas a recycling plant will make what comes out the back end, depends on what you put on the front, in the front end. And we sell a plastic that has a one to three tons lower CO2 per ton of plastic footprint, and we get to close the loop and make more sustainable products. And that's indeed what I did at MBA Polymers. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on MBA specifically. That was, I, I sent a lot of links in the pre-reads. Uh, and some of those were videos, which would take you, walk you through some of the MBA Polymers plants. But I thought it was kind of interesting what some of the popular press came up with. Uh, Forbes said, we're, here's, here's a company making uh, money out of junk. And here's a company, one of the few companies on the planet that actually likes high-priced oil. And I said, yeah, I like very high-priced oil. <laughs> I still do today, frankly. I wish I'd like to see oil much higher priced for lots of reasons, frankly. Um, I actually like this one better because I used to say we do above ground mining. And I, I still think that's what you do when you're recycling materials. Uh, instead of digging a hole in the ground or drilling for uh, oil or natural gas um, underground, you're taking stuff that's already been it's already been refined to a certain point and simply pulling it out of the waste stream and reusing it again. Much, it's a much better business model to be in. So we grew from literally from my garage here in the East Bay of San Francisco Bay Area um, to a pilot plant in Berkeley and a semi-production plant in Richmond. Then we designed, built, and operated three world-scale production plants and we operated those in three different countries. The first plant we built was in, the first world-scale plant we built was in Guangzhou, China. The second one was in Austria. And the third one was in the UK. And each one of these plants were bigger, more, more um, capable, and um, more capacity. And could take much more complicated, each one could take more progressively more complicated waste streams. These three plants together uh, were able to have a processing capacity of over 250 million pounds a year. Uh, so we achieved quite a bit. Nobody told, nobody thought we could even get one of these plants operational. And we got three up and running commercial, making money. Another factor, if, if you're building a mission-driven company, one of the, I would say, one of the competitive advantages that you have that sometimes is overlooked is that there's a lot of organizations that are eager to help you. If you're, if you're out to, to, to save the world in some way or another, just to pick any, any 
problem that we face. There's a lot of organizations out there and we, we received a lot of help. Uh, the Economist gave us the, the, their 2010 Innovation Award. That was the same year Steve Jobs got an award for uh, consumer products. Um, we got the Gothenburg Award, um, which is often called the Nobel Prize in the Environment. This was previously won by people like Kofi Annan and um, Al Gore. I was able to pick this up from the Crown Prince of Norway in uh, Davos uh, a few years ago, the, the Circulars Award, and we won the very first Davos Prize that same year, where the seven um, category winners, and namely deep companies like Patagonia, Nike, uh, the audience voted on who should who had the biggest impact on making a difference, and they selected us over these much larger companies and organizations. <clears throat> so I felt pretty good. And okay, this is a little bit about bragging rights, but it's more about if you're a mission-driven company, this is a secret, secret weapon that you can tap into. People really want to help you promote what you're doing. It makes fundraising easier. It makes communications easier. It helps your whole business. And this is a secret weapon you need to tap into when you're a mission-driven company. I learned lots of lessons. Uh, along the way, I raised money from every conceivable source. Uh, started off with 7 million non-dilutive. I encourage all of our entrepreneurs that we work with, get as much money with, from non-investor sources before you take money from us as investors. Um, raised $150 million of equity from every, again, every conceivable source, starting with friends and family, angels, small VCs, corporate VCs, strategics, you name it. And we were able to leverage our partnerships in each of these countries uh, by using their balance sheets. Uh, so we were able to have access low cost debt. I learned how to scale hard tech literally from a lab, tiny lab, well, literally from my garage to a lab, to a pilot, to world scale. Probably one of the most important lessons I learned was to hire people different and better than myself. And once I realized I didn't have all the answers, I couldn't possibly be expected to have all the answers is when my business took off and started bringing on people smarter, better, and very different than me. I had to manage teams spread across three different continents and three different you know, multi-time zones. And I also learned uh, that the types of investors you have really matter. We were blessed with some very good, strong, understanding investors. The only thing I wish they had had was entrepreneurial experience. And that's something I'm trying to fix now in, in the job I have now at Evoke. So now it's, it was time for my next pivot. Where do, I, where do I want to go? I felt like I'd solved, I'd shown that you can make money and solve, solve a problem. You can have a different, different business model. You can make money doing it. What do I do next? I want them to leverage what I learned. I wanted to continue working on stuff I cared about. I wanted to try to try to solve big and important problems using cool technology and working with other highly motivated people. And of course, let's not forget that curve that goes up and to the right. Well, investors like curves that go up and to the right. I know I certainly I certainly painted a picture that our curves were going to go up and to the right. Now I have to say our curves took longer to go up and to the right than, than I initially projected, but uh, they eventually got there. In fact, investors like, like ho what is known as hockey stick growth. Uh, we also saw, you know, about this time frame when I started looking at what to do next, which was uh, let's say seven or eight or nine years ago, it was pretty clear that the clean tech 1.0 bubble was busting. And a lot of the traditional investors uh, were moving away from clean tech and there was this huge void of, of investors. That's not so much the case today, but that was certainly the case six or seven or eight years ago. And all the, the investors stopped looking at clean tech and started looking for unicorns. So um, what we find <laughs> is that the reality of unicorns is more closely related to this. And much of clean tech involves hard tech or tough tech, tech. And what does that mean? That means you need lots of money and lots of time, neither of which investors are too inclined to, to spend uh, with, with startups. More impor importantly, I believe at the time, and I still do, 
uh, that there are a number of areas with more urgent real exponential growth, not just the financial exponential growth. A lot of these you're gonna be very familiar with and that's the, the population explosion, right? It took us, um, it took us, what was it? It took us 130 years to go from 1 billion to 2 billion. It's only gonna take one tenth that time to add the next billion, 13 years. That's exponential growth. Another very sad exponential growth is our loss of species. A lot of people call it the sixth great extinction. We're losing between 150 to 200 species every single day. It's mind boggling. And if you put these graphs over on top of one another, it's hard to think that there might not be some relationship between uh, population growth of humans and the population extinction of other species. It seems like I'm always attracted to tackling tough uh, waste problems. This is a waste that I'm currently focused on, which is uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere. We all know about this. I assume everyone on this is not surprised to anyone on, on this particular uh, Zoom call. And of course, if you look at the temperature relationship with the carbon dioxide, there's been a very close relationship to that, to these two phenomena, maybe until recently. So look at what's happened to CO2 recently and look at the lag with temperature. And if we zoom in on this last, you know, th this is what, this is uh, 20,000 years, but if we zoom in over the last, you know, 100 plus years, you see that, yes, there is an upward trend and they do seem to be tracking and tracking starting that temperature curve is finally starting to turn up, turn up, which is pretty daggone scary. It's accelerating because that has some huge Im implications. And you might ask, so why, why in the world has there been this huge lag with the CO, the CO2 doing this and the temperature still not quite uh, heading straight up? Well, part of it is most of that heat, it, the Earth's a really big place, so it takes a long time to, to heat up the Earth. Thank, that's a good thing. We've got this lag time. But the oceans have been our heat sink. So most of the, most of the heat's been dumped into the ocean. So not only are we dumping plastic into the oceans and toxic waste for decades, we're now dumping heat and CO2 into the oceans at an insane scale. I mean, it's in some ways we have to be thankful for the oceans that we're not experiencing more dramatic changes here on earth, on land, uh, because of the oceans, but the oceans are being impacted just dramatically by, by this, by both ocean warming and acidification. On the warming side, ice starts melting, obviously, sea levels start rising. We all know, we've all heard about that. And if we lose some of the big ice sheets, we're gonna see some significant, not, not these inches or, or even feet type of, of rises. We could be in store for very serious. Uh, if, if you don't believe me, talk to Steve Chu over at Stanford. <laughs> he, will, he will set you straight on, on what we might really be expecting in the, in the future for sea level rise. And of course, just last year was a record year for our ocean temperatures. That's not slowing down. What's the, the besides coastal cities uh, being flooded, which will lead to this, this huge, potentially lead to this huge uh, mass migration, climate led migration. There's droughts and there are floods uh, due to climate change are increasing. And the UN now estimates that between, you know, at least 200 million people might be uh, move, on the move by 2050. We know in the last few years what a few million people, one or two or three million people on the move has done to upset society, particularly in Europe. Can you imagine what not 10 times this amount or two or three times this amount or 10 times this amount, but 100 times that amount of people on the move? what that's going to do to disrupt society. And some estimates say it could be a billion people by 2050. I, I think these are extreme. I certainly hope they're extreme, but it doesn't matter. 10 million, 50 million, 100 million people on the move is not, it does not bode well for the future, for society, for social unrest. So you, can, you could look at climate change as an accelerant, this climate stew that we're brewing, you know, 2020 has been a crazy year. We're worried about, we got political stress, we've got uh, employees stress, people out of jobs, we've got fires here in California and other places. And of course we got COVID. 
Just wait until climate rage becomes an epidemic. Your younger generations are starting to get the idea that the future may not be as pretty for them as it was for us. And, and I'm worried about that too. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Just wait until they lose their homes. Just wait until they can't find food. That's gonna be a, a stress on a whole nother level that we have not yet experienced. So where do we wanna go? Whoops. We certainly don't wanna go here. We don't wanna see, for lots of reasons, we don't wanna see hundreds of millions of people displaced and desperate to find food and housing. So we need to move to more sustainable business models and communities, and we need a future generation that can take all the benefits we've enjoyed, that we've taken for granted, and enjoy those same benefits for decades from now. So I'm jumping to who's gonna get us there, and then I'm gonna come back to how do we get there. So what about the usual suspects, <clears throat> government and NGOs? I'm not gonna go there because I could spend hours expressing my frustration on the government and how slow it moves. Um, I actually spent a few years flying between the West Coast and Washington DC uh, in the Obama administration, trying to get uh, some aspects of the uh, climate policy passed that never happened. So I have to say I'm a little frustrated with that whole process, even when we had what we thought were tailwinds. Uh, so what about industry, large companies? That's the other group that's often looked to to solve the problems. What about small and medium enterprises and what about individuals? So I'm gonna talk about these last three. Let's start with big companies. I'm just gonna give you two examples. So Unilever is hailed as one of the leaders in the world in sustainability space. When CEO Pullman came, in, came to charge, or uh, became CEO of uh, Unilever, he said, we're gonna double in size and half our carbon footprint at the same time. That was a pretty audacious goal. And they, they've actually made some great progress on that. From 2008 to 2014, they, they uh, reduced, um, they saw a million metric tons uh, CO2 reduced from their operations, which is about 167,000 metric tons per year and about one metric ton per year per Unilever employee. I just wanna put this on a, equal basis so we can compare impacts. Uh, CC inter, uh, CCE is uh, Coca-Cola Enterprises in, in uh, Europe. Um, they also made some very uh, audacious CO2 reduction um, goals for themselves and achieved even double on a per year per employee impact uh, compared to uh, Unilever between 2007 and 2013. This was the data I had available. So what about individuals? Well, what can individuals really do? We often ask everyone, I love this quote from Leo Tolstoy, who says, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. I think individuals can do a lot. And let me just give you one example that I kind of know about. So we made four lifestyle changes. These aren't lifestyle changes I suggest that you have to make, but these were four we've made. We went solar. We use bikes and trains more than cars, our entire family. We air dry our clothes outside, which you know is a little strange here in Northern California, but that's what we do. And we've gone mostly vegan, not 100%, but we've gone mostly that way. If you add this up, that works out to be about five metric tons per year per person. So we made five times the impact of what a much more, a bigger, multinational like Unilever was able to make with all of its efforts towards climate change by making what I would argue were positive changes in our lifestyle. Now I have to be full disclosure here, like I've been trying to be in the entire talk. I, flew, I flew a lot in my previous days. I'm trying to fly a lot less these days. Just a small round trip to Denver would be a negative 0.5. So I, I it doesn't take very many flights to erase my entire savings just by these four lifestyle changes. Just saying. So I, for one, very much like these Zoom calls because it means I can talk to people around the world and not have to get on an airplane. Um, what about small to medium enterprises? I, um, I love this quote from Margaret Mead that said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I completely agree with that. So another example near and dear to my heart, one I know about, this was our plant in Austria. 
a research institute called IMPA in Switzerland did a LCA, life cycle assessment on our process. And they concluded, and it was refereed by a very difficult, I would say, climate or LCA expert in Sweden. It made them change their, their calculus many times. But in the end, they came out with uh, a savings for our plant of 90,000 metric tons per year, which works out to be 900 metric tons of CO2 per employee per year. So my point is, a business, a small to medium enterprise can make a lot more impact just by coming up with a more sustainable business model than anything we can do as individuals or, or large corporations. So that leads me to how do we get there? And I'm gonna use, I know I'm kind of, kind of gone heavy on the quotes today, but I, I love many of these quotes. Uh, people say it much better than I can. But Minister Fuller pointed out that uh, you can't change things by fighting the existent reality. And boy, I, I can tell you, I've learned that the hard way myself. You have to, if you want to change something, you have to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's, that's what I tried to set out to do with MBA. I tried to show that there was a better way to make plastics from waste versus petrochemicals. And even better examples are Tesla, SpaceX, and Apple. They didn't try to change the existing reality. They just showed people the way. They, they created that new reality. And that's what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to help people a lot smarter than me and, and more passionate than me through our startups create a new reality on many different fronts. So I first tried to do it myself as a startup advisor. That's what I did with uh, Material Solutions or an angel investor, but I quickly realized I couldn't write very big checks and I was spread way too thin. I tried to start my own venture fund or I thought about it, uh, but it was nearly impossible after Cleantech 1.0 bubble burst. All of my former investors on my board said, you're nuts, Mike, we're all leaving Cleantech. No one wants to invest in Cleantech right now. That bubble, that train left a long time ago. I could try to join an existing fund, but they're typically looking for financial engineers and we're turning away from hard tech. Or I could listen to my own advice, which is sort of following the rules of the Steve Blank model. Go out and talk to dozens of investors, find out what the real world is like and challenge, go back and challenge my assumptions. So my basic assumption was kind of garbage man, basically what, what could I possibly bring to climate change? So some thoughts on that. Where do we mine plastics? Well, we either mine it in concentrated sources or in dilute sources. And in fact, I was uh, part of this group in, this is the North Atlantic Gyre, uh, the Sargassum Sea, uh, where we were trying to look at the, how much plastic was in the ocean. We had a lot of brands out there with us, like uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, Dow Chemical was out there. We were floating around the sea trying to show them where the plastics end up and the impact it has on the marine life. So possible solutions are make less of it, of course. We talked about that. Capture it at the source or remove it later. And I can tell you, removing it from the oceans, I'm not counting on that happening, at least not in my lifetime. It's a very difficult thing to do. What about CO2 and other greenhouse gases? Well, it can be found in concentrated forms or point sources, they're called. And it's, of course, it's, as we know, it's in the air at around a little over 400 parts per million. What are some possible solutions? Same thing. We can make less of it, which we're trying to do. We can capture it at the source, which we're doing a little bit of. And we can remove it later with things like called, uh, direct air capture and mineralization approaches. And the businesses are also very similar. You gather it. You purify it and you do something with it. And in the case of CO2, one good thing to do with it is sequestering it because it stays where it's put if we sequester it properly. But you can also make products out of it, which is a great thing to do from an economic standpoint. But the problem with some of these products is they're short lived. So you just put the CO2 back in the environment again, and you got to make sure that there's a solution for, for that product at end of life if you really want to have a long-term solution for the CO2. So finally, what am I doing at Evoke? This is exactly what we're doing at Evoke. Uh, one of those many conversations I had with VCs paid off. Um, my now, now, now partner, Marty Reed, 
who is the CEO of Evoke Innovations. He was asked to, to run this organization a little over five years ago and then uh, reached out to me and asked him if I would help. It's a unique partnership between the, the British Columbia uh, Clean Tech CEO Alliance, Suncor Energy, and Synovus Energy. It was founded in 2015 with a $100 million commitment. It's led by unusually uh, experienced entrepreneurs. That's very unusual in a, in a, a VC fund. Uh, clean tech, experienced clean tech investors and energy executives. And our mission is to protect the environment by investing and strengthen the economy by investing in commercialization of clean technologies. One of our major focuses is CDR, which is carbon dioxide removal. In fact, all of our investments must have a positive environmental impact, especially around climate. And in the CDR space, we've made two investments directly in that space so far, both here in the Bay Area. One is Mosaic Materials, which came out of UC Berkeley and Cyclotron Road. And the other is probably well known to some people in this call. It's Opus 12, which came out of Stanford, Tomcat, Sardex, and Cyclotron Road. So Mosaic is a super absorbent for CO2, and Opus 12 uh, turns CO2 into new materials, new chemicals. So it's this CO2 utilization. So I'm just going to end with a few more quotes, sorry, but I, I love some of these quotes because I think that they kind of summarize some of the points I've been trying to make. You got to be a little crazy. You got to be out there. You need to have the passion. You got to be willing to believe that you can make a difference. Otherwise, you're not going to have any chance of doing that. And, and my message to you is you can. If you, if you have the passion, if you're doing something you really care about, you can make a difference. And I found this quote just this, this evening, right before this, this call. Jobs actually talked about connecting the dots. He says, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only do it backwards. He says, you have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. I think that was from his days when he spent in the Far East. Uh, this approach has never let me down and has made all the difference in my life. Now, I'm hoping, I, I think something else he also said is that there's, there's one thing that differentiates people who achieve from those who only dream. And it was just, the, the achievers are ones who aren't afraid of using four simple words. Can you help me? So that's been my mission in this, in this whole presentation is to connect just a few of the dots, point out a few sign posts, posts that work for me and pointing me in the right direction and ask for help. I could have never, gotten to where I am today without en enormous help from enormous numbers of people. Just ask. And along those lines, I encourage you to go take a look at the uh, the pre-read, the pre-brief. There's some help in there. There's some, some, I think most of that is, most of this is in the pre-brief. And uh, I'm here to answer questions if we have time. Thank you, um, Mike. Before we uh, start on questions. I, I just want to say for the, the participants, um, you're, you're going to get a, uh, a follow-up email. Um, there's a survey. We would love to hear your feedback um, on, on this series and uh, any sort of suggestions. Also, um, plastic is, the, is the, the main theme for this year. So we're going to have, we're going to have a couple more sessions. So, um, so your, uh, your suggestions on, on uh, focus areas to discuss there. Um, and also there's a, we, we have a LinkedIn uh, network um, that we've connected people to through our innovation showcases before. You'll also have a chance to uh, connect uh, through that. So you'll, there'll be a link to that through the email as well. Um, so, uh, so Mike, again, thank you for, uh, for giving that, that, that perspective and, and connecting the dots. Um, I, I want to start with a, a question around recycling, um, the question is a, maybe ultimately a, a technical one, but I'll, since you described this kind of, you know, as a journey, you know, through the, through the perspective of your personal journey, I'll, I'll ask it as a personal question, actually. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure I fully understand or I fully buy your, your pivot number two, um, because you, you lay out this problem um, and the, this garbage problem that is coupled to an exponential growth of plastic production. And then you, you spent 20 years developing a solution. Um, and then 
it, not only that, going from lab to um, you know, world scale uh, factory. So, so you, you showed that the technology can work and can succeed. But I mean, so, so that is the entry point then to solving the problem. Right. So, so my, my personal question is, why not stick around to try to scale that to get exponential growth of recycling to solve the problem? If you, you know, we make the connection to Tesla, if Musk had stopped at, at the Roadster, who would be talking about electrifying the transportation fleet right now? So I, I guess I don't understand that. If you, if you see like, and, and uh, you know, I'm sure it relates to some of the challenges of scaling recycling. So my, my real question is about scaling recycling. It, what are the prospects for that to grow at the same pace of the growth of plastic production? And, and what, are the, what are the challenges to that? And, and at the personal level, you know, why, why not try to pull that off? Uh, no, it's an awesome question. I, I, I can, I, it's a really good question. Um, I hope I have a decent answer. <laughs> we'll see. Um, there's many reasons, frankly. Uh, I, I will tell you the first is I was a bit bored. I've been doing it for 20 years. I felt like I had done most of what my personal passion could accomplish and my personal interest could accomplish and my personal talent set could accomplish. The, the bigger reason uh, was, and sort of forced my hand, but I was heading that direction anyway. I think he even said I left MBA uh, I stayed on the board. Uh, they made it worth my while to stay on the board, but I left MBA, started Material Solutions before we sold the company. But I, they brought me back to help sell the company. Um, but uh, I did that because I, I felt like I had learned the majority of what I could learn, and I I had contributed the majority of what I could contribute with my passion and my talent set, my set of talents. And I will tell you that uh, Tesla was not invented by Elon Musk, right? <laughs> Elon Musk is the one that took a good thing and turned it into this phenomena that still to this day amazes me how successful he's been. Um, so I didn't know if I was the right person to do that, number one. And number two, I, well, I knew I wasn't the right person because I bit lost the passion. My interest had gone from plastics to literally climate change. And I, I think that's reflected in, in my conversation. And that was the signpost for me, as I said, that's the signpost that matters for me. That, that's the problem I wanna solve next. That's where I have passion. Okay. So my passion jumped from plastic waste to climate change. And that, that was the real reason I decided I'm not the right person uh, anymore to, to okay. do this, this effort. And it goes back to my, my very first comment. If you don't have the passion, it's not good for you and it's not good for the thing that you're leaning right. uh, to stick with that. So that, that was the main reason. And, and we sold the company to a, 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 so the third factor is I had VCs and we were well past their time. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> one of the things that, that my partner, Marty, brilliantly changed with the model of our model is we have a more like an evergreen fund. So we don't have this 10 year, typical time, time frame that a, almost every single venture fund has on the, on the face of the planet, other than Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is 20 years. Most are 10 years. So that means when they invest in you, typically five, six, seven years, they're looking for an exit. Well, my investors were past that. <laughs> and then, you know, they weren't the right, it needed to be in the hands of a much bigger entity that could finance it with lower cost capital than venture capital. That, that's the other reason. So, so, so is it, owners, it was time to transition it to someone that had passionate for doing exactly as you said. And, and, and I'm hoping it's in those right hands. I follow it a little bit. It, it is, it is built, it's only built one more plant. It's looking at another. I'd like, I was hoping it would go faster. <laughs> yeah, so, so can, you, can you comment a little just on the, I mean, maybe just from the technical perspective, what are the scaling challenges? It, 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 and, and the plastic, so the, the waste that that you valorize or you extract the polymers from is that what's the overlap between that waste stream and the stream that that ends up in the ocean is, is it is it the same or, or what also is two really good questions so i'll answer the second one first because that's easy so so we focused and they're actually related we focused on uh, and you'll see it from the videos that i, I provided links to in the briefing um, 
we focused on durable goods, end of life durable goods. So automobiles, computer scrap, electronics, appliances, things like that. And the reason we did that is because there was a really well-developed infrastructure for collecting that waste and managing it through its entire life cycle, which meant proper recycling of all the components in that waste in Europe and in Japan. Okay. Uh, and, and it came to Korea, eventually came to South Korea, excuse me, and other regions of the globe, other regions of the world, except of course for the United States. And in fact, you might notice that, yes, my first two, my pilot plant and my semi-production plant were in the US, but all of our commercial plants were overseas. And that's because that's where the feedstock was. And that's the answer to your second question. So the reason we focus on dur those, those durable goods streams, A, nobody else was focusing on them. They are super complicated, much more complicated than the stuff that you put in your waste at your home. Uh, so it's got toxic materials, it's got brominated flame retardants, uh, it's got heavy metals, it's got batteries, it's got, you know, electronics, it's got beryllium. I mean, there are so many toxic material concerns that our process had to be super complicated to deal with this very complicated mix of materials coming in. And we were able to do that through a fully automated process. And we were able to do a better name on the planet still to this day, as far as I understand, as far as I know. Um, not easy, as you'll see from the videos, but we, yeah. we managed to pull it off. I tried, I will tell you, I tried for a decade to try to reproduce that model in the US. So why isn't MBA, why aren't there 20, 30, 40, 50 MBA plants around the world? And particularly, why aren't they here in the US? Lack of feedstock. And, and, and that's because th there's not the infrastructure to sort the durable good way. I mean, there's got to be the same well, volume no, of it, stuff it, for more, right? It's insane. So the U.S. has more feedstock than any place on the planet. But yeah. up until very recently, all the, the uh, stuff from MRF, so your household waste, all of that was shipped. You saw the outcome of that. It was being shipped overseas to China because it was difficult. We, we would... The MRF material recovery facilities here in the U.S. would pull off ones and twos. I have some diagrams that we have time I can show you. We pull off the easy stuff and send all the, the difficult to recycle plastics overseas and you saw what happens when, when you do that, right? It ends up in the wrong place. Um, I tried, I, I cannot tell you how many discussions I had I, with the big name waste companies. I could name them, you know who they are. And many very frustrating conversations over, t over a decade trying to convince them all I wanted from them. The only thing I wanted from them was a long-term supply agreement. Without that, I could not finance a plan. I had those in Europe and Asia. I could get long-term supply agreements from the because they were required that, their, that the stuff coming from durable goods was recycled responsibly. And we could prove that we could do that so we could get long-term supply agreements. I could, get, I could finance a plant. Without yeah, yeah. that, I can't finance a plant in the US. And they said, well, well, we'll probably send it to you. But of course, if a, if a Chinese broker pays us a penny more a pound, literally, I had this exact conversation with every CEO of every waste company in the US including Recology here in San Francisco. Sorry, Mike. I love Mike San Giacomo. He's awesome. I know him well. But he said, no, pity more a pound. I have to sell it to the trader. I, that, that's my job. My job is to make money for the city, you know, and, or to try to reduce the cost of my operations. And, and do you think that that, I don't know how long ago that was. I mean, do, do you think that has changed? Well, it's or changed could, now because yeah. that outlet's gone thanks to the, it used to be the yeah, green yeah, fence. Sure. I saw four or five generations of green fences, but now they've got, what is it called? The something sword, national sword. And that's more serious. Okay. So yeah, those outlets are, they're not there anymore or they're not as abundant as they were. So that, and so now they're going to Vietnam. I can actually know yeah. for a fact. They're, they're, they're going to other places in Southeast Asia. They're going to Africa, but, but it, it's hard. It, it's hard to move that amount of plastic waste. I, I wish, to be honest, I, I can't tell you how many times I said, we sold, we sold the company like six or seven years too early. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so the, I guess at a sort of more global level, so, so why, um, I mean, are we really running out of landfill space? If, if that's like, it sounds like shipping our waste is, you know, the biggest source of that pollution stream for the ocean. I, it's um, probably worth, let me see. I'm, if you, do you mind if I share again? I've please. got three no, slides. Yeah, 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 please. That I think that we'll, we'll touch this better than I can with words. 
if you don't mind. Let's see if this works. I hope please work. Is, is that working? Can everybody see that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So really quickly, I, I think this will explain the problem. So here's the evolution of household waste recycling. You may re I lived in Germany for a while. I had to carry my waste down to the end of the street and put them in these little igloos they were called, you know, and I had to sort it. So human sorting. That doesn't work in the US. People aren't up for that. It worked in Germany. They actually had garbage police. It was pretty impressive in Munich where I lived. So we moved to this thing called blue bins, thanks to Toronto. They came out with this blue bin program. It kind of swept the nation for a while, but even you know, Americans aren't really up for even this level of sorting, even a curbside sorting. So we went to single source, right? We dumped everything in one bin. That's what I have here at my house today. I put all the recyclables in one bin. So paper, metal, glass, plastic. That goes to a MRF, material recovery facility. That MRF, from the plastic standpoint, typically sorts out PET rich streams and polyolefin rich streams or polyethylene primarily, some do polypropylene as well. Those get shipped overseas or they might get shipped to local recyclers who then sell those products domestically or overseas. And that waste, which is often the mixed plastics, um, goes into either landfill or incineration. The mixed plastic residual, what are often called the threes through sevens, the, the difficult to recycle plastics, the ones that aren't typically sorted in these MRFs, have, as we talked about, used to go overseas, still do to some extent, or it went to landfill or incineration. There's one thing in this photo that I see that I doubt any other folks see unless you've been in the recycling world. There's a big, big problem with this picture. Way too many touches. The only people making money in this scenario are the truck drivers or the ship drivers, right? Look how many times this material is touched. Look how many times it's transported. You cannot make money recycling a low value material touching it this many times. It is nearly impossible. In fact, well, and in fact, so one other factor that um, you, you alluded to that it's hard to get, send this stuff overseas. So 180 countries, over 180 countries, not including the US, does that sound familiar? Let's see, Kyoto Treaty, uh, what else have we signed up for? Um, agreed to restrict global plastic trade everybody but the US, right? So we can still send plastic anywhere we want legally if, they're, if we find a buyer, but most of the world has said, no, we can't, gotta stop doing that, it's crazy, because it ends up in the oceans. It ends, ends up with all those pictures that I showed you. So what we need to do here in the US to address the problem and to, if we signed up for this waistband, we'd have to do more processing in the US. And here's how you do it. You touch it once and move on. Any recycler, anyone in the waste business will say, Fewer touches, the better. Which is why most MRFs just like want to touch it very little and then sell it to somebody and be done with it, right? So what we demonstrated with our technology is you can send completely mixed plastics instead of these pre-sorted streams of PET and pre-sorted streams of polyethylene, which you can of course upgrade with very simple recycling technologies. Well, we developed a much more complex recycling technology where we can send in plastic, you know, seven, eight, ten, 10 different types of plastic and sort it out in one facility. We don't get it all. It's impossible, even with our sophisticated process. So the rest would go to chemical recycling and energy generation. You'd have a near, near zero waste solution with a scenario like this, and you touch it twice instead of all those times that I showed before. This will lead to a lower handling costs, economies, you get economies of scale because you're able to build a bigger plant because you're getting more material to a single plant. You're making multiple products. You've got less market risk instead of just making one product. And you, as I said, you get to near zero waste. Therefore, finally, plastics do become more sustainable. The, the problem with plastics is not inherent of the material. The material it has huge benefits. That's why we use so much of it. It's what we do. It's how we manage the waste. It's that simple. So the, but the, the problem, like the reason that this is not implementable today is because is that first truck, we just don't have a good stream. Yeah, well, to... the reason, this facility that I'm kind of trying to circle with my little pointer here yeah. 
it needs fine. It needs to be financed. This is a right. But the obstacle to that dollars. is no, is bad. It is you just don't have a guarantee. You need this guarantee right here. This is exactly. what you need. And okay. I still, so I challenged one of the big companies. I, again, I, I careful not to mention too many names, but there's only a few very large waste companies in the U.S. So I challenged the, the head of uh, uh, sustainability for one of these waste companies on that boat that I talked about where we were in the Sargassum Sea this last summer, and said, "Will you sign a long-term supply agreement with you?" with me, if you will, I can I can make this plant happen. And in fact, you can own it. I'll show you how to build it. It, it can be yours. Or, or I can find someone else to build it. All that needs to happen is you sign a long-term supply agreement. Oh, Mike, we still don't do that. <laughs> you know? Well, what are you doing with it today? Oh, we're putting in landfills. Which, unfortunately, the waste companies make more money putting in landfills than they do recycling it. So they don't mind putting in landfills. They just charge their communities more. They own lots of holes and they own lots of trucks. So that's the problem. You need to, this is the problem right here. It's these people that operate these MERS. They're not motivated to sign up for this solution. Thank you, that's really helpful. So I, I think it has to be done, but so the cities are the ones that get the contracts. Unfortunately, those contracts are 10 to 20 years. So I, I said, oh, wait a minute. You won't build this MRF unless you get a 20 year contract from the city. That makes sense. You're a smart business person. That's all. I just want a 10 year contract <laughs> so I can build my plant to take your waste. <laughs> yeah. It seems so obvious, right? But yeah. uh, no, we don't have any plants in the US. I will say that it's starting to happen. Uh, there is a, there's a plant trying to get off the ground in Ohio, there's a few other plants trying to get off the ground more either following just the mechanical recycling model or the chemical recycling model. I, I would say the chemical recycling model is being promoted largely by the plastics industry right now. And I get it for handling the entire, instead just send this truck to the here is what they're suggesting. But I know chemical recycling really well. You still have to do something to it before you put it in one of these plants. Yeah. Otherwise this plant really is unhappy. So if you're going to do something to it, extract value from that something and then send that material that's that's okay. You have to take out things like PVC. They don't tend to like chlorine in these plants, things like that. So you do that. And while you're doing that, you pull out the valuable plastics you can pull out, send the rest for chemical recycling and energy recovery. And then, then you've got a, you've got an economic large scale, almost zero waste solution in my opinion. But it all starts with getting these folks to offer the same agreements that they demand from the cities before they'll put in their sorting facility, their, their waste facility. Great, right. thank you. It, yeah. I know it doesn't make any sense, but yeah, I, again, I just tested it last summer. So. <laughs> in an environment where we were all talking about solving the plastic waste problem. <laughs> Surrounded by system. waste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to I want to take a question from uh, one of our, our our audience members. So, uh, uh, Mon Monim, uh, if you could, I am unable. Oh, there you go. And by the way, I've, I've pivoted to solving for climate, but you can tell I'm still passionate about this, and <laughs> it's uh, it needs to be solved. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for uh, this is great. It's uh, I am. Uh, uh, a founder of a startup uh, that has been uh, climbing through this really big struggle to do something. And um, uh, so I'm a materials engineer. We have five patents uh, related to uh, conversion of therm thermochemical conversion of mixed waste. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, as you know, the, you know, in the U.S. here, we have 268 million tons per year of total municipal solar waste. Out of that is about 20%. We're talking about 50 million tons per year of mixed residual waste, which is plastics and paper. It's about 60% um, paper and 40% plastics. Plastics that is not recyclable, mm -hmm. film plastics. And that is, uh, a lot of it goes to, uh, to landfill. Uh, the, the problem is that not only that that plastic carries a lot of energy content in it, and it goes to a landfill and sits there forever, 
the paper that's trapped in it is a major, the major source of greenhouse gas emissions from landfill. You know that we've got 600 tons per day carried by the company you mentioned earlier from, uh, you know, the area from Mountain View up to San Francisco to every day, two yeah. hours to Sacramento to a landfill. So we've um, been struggling to find a way to solve the problem. Uh, we, we focused on the MRF and we invented, not invented, but somehow came up with models to, uh, to for something called we called integrated materials and energy recovery facility, as opposed to materials recovery facility. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, uh, the, the best you could do it out of MRF, as you know, is to get about 20% recyclables, yep. including plastics, everything. And then you have 40% uh, food waste and organic waste. And luckily we've got composting and aerobic digestion for that. And then what you have is that 20% or even up to 30% of that mixed uh, dirty packaging plastics that has film plastics, which we cannot eat food without food without it. You know, it, no matter what we get, it's all packaged. That is what we focused on. We've been what we've been try, working with uh, companies in the recycling business to uh, to to uh, in, in introduce our uh, system to the market and help create these integrated materials and energy recovery facilities. Unfortunately, not very successful in doing that. So I did a similar thing a few years ago, and I spoken to the same company that and the the, the, the uh, CEO, uh, you know told me, look, go to the companies that create the waste. Uh, because of California, we got requirement of 70% diversion right now. But how do we get there? Said so these guys, these people don't want to send their stuff to the landfill. Go convince them that uh, they should fund uh, an IMRF here in the, in the Bay Area, uh, and then we can build it. So I, I actually, we started talking to the source companies. And we said, okay, why don't we find a way to create a, a, a solution at the source as opposed to doing the IMER? I'm not talking about the plastics that you're tackling, the ones that are actually uh, mineable, uh, that are recyclable. I'm talking about the unrecyclable mixed waste that is there. So we've been focusing on creating something that is integrated within a facility, within a, like a campus facility. If you go to any campus facility, it uses, it has a boiler. It uses energy, mm -hmm. natural gas, and uh, and all of them do the either cafeteria waste, all kinds of different waste, or lab waste, significant amount of waste. So we've been trying to create this model where, you know, we go to uh, an industrial facility or a campus facility and install our system that takes the residual waste and turn it into energy and, and send this, what we call a pyro fuel along with it to the boiler. This way that that waste is not transported anywhere. And this is the start of our climb through this new challenge, which is not significantly not easy to do. It's, uh, I'm, I'm sure I, I don't wanna, you understand what I, what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, there's, and I put some links to some gasification and pyrolysis companies in my pre-brief materials, um, which are doing somewhat similar things, some on small scale, some on very large scale. Um, and I think the thing that you, if you're going to, particularly if you're going to be doing it locally, you have to worry about emissions, right? You, you have to worry about potential dioxins and other effluent coming off of whatever it is you're deriving energy from, so. Mike, I think it would be helpful um, since there was uh, a lot of interest in this area and some of the um, questions we got ahead of the event. Can, can you give some perspective on um, the, the notion that, okay, wh why don't we just try to convert as much as possible to, to biodegradable? I would if, mm -hmm. sort of summarize your, your thoughts on that. I think that would be right. Uh, and I, again, I touched on the pre-brief. It, it's, a, it's a contentious subject, <laughs> let's just say, depending on Whose perspective? I, I'm going to try to be as balanced as I can. I, I can be more balanced now that I'm not a I'm not a living and dying by recycling like I used to. <laughs> so everything was 
everything that was not recycling was not good this in my book back in yeah. the day but now everything's good as far as i'm concerned so i you see me promoting waste energy chemical recycling i think biodegradable plastics absolutely play a role and where they play a role is where well first let's talk about you can have biopolymers and this i just want to spend a moment here because people get confused so you can have polymers that are made from bio sourced materials derived from bio sourced materials that can be biodegradable or not they can they can be standard and then you can have biodegradable plastics that can be made from biopolymers or they can actually be made from petrochemicals they can still be biodegradable and i think matt what you asked about was just biodegradable so that is that correct right yeah yeah just just to give perspective on you know is, is that how much can that solve the weight like the pollution problem right it, 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 and I, and I think for, I think it absolutely has a role for things that are not going to be recoverable. And I think film is one of those areas that you have to think about. Uh, I have to say that the film's a pretty valuable material. We do film recycling in my house, you know, they now take it, you know, we make a little football out of it every, every week, right? We stamp, stuff all the plastic bags in one bag and tie it off and throw it in the, in the recycle bin. I'm hoping it gets recycled. They can make things like plastic lumber out of it. So you call that downcycling, but I can tell you Trex plastic lumber is a pretty quality product. So I'm, I, I'm okay with that personally. Um, but I still think there's a lot of single use plastics that where biodegradability is probably the best answer. Um, simply because they're gonna, you know, they're not gonna find their way to a recycling route. Now, is it a better, there's people that have done life cycle assessments, and I think I touched on that just briefly in my pre-briefs. Depending on how you run the life cycle assessment, it's uh, and what you count. I mean, particularly if you're doing a biopolymer derived one, then you know you have to grow the crop, you have to put fertilizer on it, so you got water, you got to harvest it, you then got to extract whatever component it is out of that harvest, and now you're kind of at the starting point where you are with petrochemicals. Right? So the whole LCA doesn't always pan out. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I, I'm not saying it can't, but it, you know, you have to. You have to consider all of those factors as well. Um, but I think the degradability aspect, and again, it doesn't have to be uh, derived from biopolymers to be biodegradable, uh, is really important. The other thing I think I pointed out in the pre-brief, I can. I could walk out in the back, my back deck right now, and show you a four-year project we have with biodegradable plastics sitting out in the hot California sun here in the East Bay. Year after year, nonstop, they're still intact. They're fully intact after four years. These are, are PLA? These are all PLA or? I think they were mostly PLA, but they, they just said biodegradable. I know some okay. were from Nature Works, so they were PLA, but some were, I don't know where they came from. Some, I don't know if they were PLA or PHA or PHB. I, I don't know what they were, but they, uh, they're still intact. They're a little brittle and they're a little dusty on the surface, uh, but so is my other plastic that's sitting out. <laughs> outside for that four years I put them in salt water and I put them in water and they're also there. <laughs> so uh, biodegradability yeah it, it requires it's usually it usually requires special conditions in a compost facility so sure, there are yeah. bi there are truly biodegradable plastics there's a USDA protocol I believe it is or FDA that, that verifies whether they're truly biodegradable in a reasonable time frame or not but there are also some that say they are and they aren't and that's been part of the problem. Yeah, and just for, for everyone's benefit, there's compostable does not equal biodegradable. I mean, there, there are different technical standards for both. So things can be compostable, which, you know, won't degrade on a human timescale on your patio, um, but will or supposed to at least in a proper composting facility. Yeah. They and, need the right microbes, the heat, the moisture, right. et cetera. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, we, we are uh, right up at the at the end of our, our time limit. So uh, let me just thank you again for for providing a, a really fantastic uh, kickoff to this to this series and perspective uh, on, on this topic and, and connecting it to, to climate uh, and, and sharing some of your uh, your personal story along the way. It's re it's really been uh, enjoyable. So thank you so much, Mike. Thank you everyone uh, for for joining us uh, today, and uh, and we certainly hope to. Uh, see you uh, at the at the next episode. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks.